Imagine now it is 1813 in the Church of Carmel. You're listening to one of those happy old liturgic celebrations which were the only public entertainment and the only musical artistic expression. You know what a sung mass is, so you can imagine what a sung mass would be like from all those years ago. I don't call your attention to the priests and the sacristans, nor to the sermon, nor to the eyes of the young Carioca girls, who were already beautiful even then, nor to the mantles of the stern senoras, the gentlemen's short breeches, the ladies' hairstyles, the ornamental drapery, the lighting, the incense, none of that. I don't even speak of the orchestra, which is excellent. I limit your attention now to one head of white, the head of that old man who conducts the orchestra with soul and devotion. His name is Roman Pires, sixty years old, no less, born in Valongo or in that vicinity. He is a good musician and a good man. All the musicians like him. Master Roman was his name to those familiar, and to be familiar and to be public was the same thing in such matters in those days. Oh, Master Roman, he's that fellow that conducts the Mass was the equivalent of this kind of announcement years later. Taking the stage is actor João Caetano, or even, actor Marcinho will sing one of his greatest arias. This was the perfect dash of spice, the suave abracadabra to excite the public. But Master Roman conducted the Mass. Who didn't know Master Roman with his air of circumspection, his downcast eyes, his sad laugh, the tentative step, but all this disappeared in front of the orchestra. Then vitality flowed from the master's whole body and his gestures. His eyes caught fire and his laugh was luminous. He was someone else. Now, this is not to say the mass was his music. The mass he's conducting at this moment in Carmo, for example, was composed by José Mauricio. Still, he conducts it with the same love as if it were his own. The celebration has now ended. It's as if an intense flash went off, leaving his face in the afterglow of ordinary light. Here he is now, coming from the chorus, supported with his cane. He continues on to the sacristy to kiss the hands of the priests and accepts a place at the lunch table, all this with indifference and in silence. He ate, left, and walked home to his street, named Mother of Men, where he lives with an old black man, Papa Joseph, who is his true mother, and who, in this moment, is conversing with a neighbor lady. There's Master Roman now, the neighbor said. "Uh Uh-oh, goodbye, miss. See you later. Papa Joseph dashed into the house and waited for the old man, who, after a little while, entered in his usual custom. The house was not naturally opulent or joyful. It showed not the least trace of a woman, old or young, nor little birds that sang, nor flowers, nor colors, vivid or joyful. The house was dark and bare. The most cheerful it got was a harpsichord where Master Roman played at times, studying, at the foot of a chair, some sheet music. None of it his. Ah, if Master Roman were able, he would be a great composer. It seems, though, that there are two types of vocations, those that speak aloud and those that do not. The first are realized. The others represent a constant struggle of sterility between the impulse inside and the absence of any way of communicating to the world. Roman was of the latter kind. His musical vocation was innate. It called forth operas and masses, a world of new and original harmonies which he was unable to express and put down on paper. This was Master Roman's only cause for sadness. And naturally, the people didn't know that's what it was. Some would say this, others that, an illness, lack of money, some old regret. But the truth is this. The cause of Master Roman's depressive air was his not being able to compose, not possessing the means for translating what he felt. It's not that he didn't scribble a lot on paper and interrogate his harpsichord for hours on end, but everything that came out of him was without form with neither an idea nor harmony. Lately, he was almost embarrassed as his neighbors listened, so he stopped trying. And yet, if he were able, he would complete at least one certain piece, a nuptial song begun three days after his marriage in 1779. His wife, who was 21 at the time and died at 23, wasn't really pretty, not even a little, but extremely likable. 
and she loved him just as much as he loved her. Three days after his marriage, Master Roman felt something inside that seemed like inspiration. It was then that he conceived the nuptial song, and he wanted to compose it. But the inspiration was unable to escape. Like a bird, just taken captive, trying to force its way through the bars of a cage, above and below, impatient, manic, so flapped the inspiration of our musician, trapped inside and unable to escape, finding no portal whatsoever. A few notes came to form a melody. He wrote them down, a page worth of work, no more. He persisted the next day, ten days later, twenty times during his marriage. When his wife died, he reread these first conjugal notes, and he became still more sad for not having fixed on paper that sensation of happiness now extinguished. Papa Joseph, he said upon entering, I feel sick today. Did you eat something that disagreed with you, sir? No, ever since this morning I wasn't feeling well. Go to the pharmacy. The pharmacist sent him something which he took that night. The next day Master Roman felt no better. Now it needs to be said that he already had a heart problem. Serious and chronic, Papa Joseph became alarmed when he saw that the discomfort didn't improve, neither with the medicine nor the rest, and he wanted to call the doctor. What for? the master said. This will pass. The day didn't finish any worse than it had been, and he managed to endure it all night. Not so his manservant, who was barely able to sleep two hours. The neighborhood just learned of the illness and wanted to talk of nothing else. Those who had a personal relationship with the master went to visit him, and they would tell him it was nothing, that these were seasonal aches and pains. One added, joking, that he was playing hooky to avoid getting schooled by the pharmacist and backgammon. Another, that it was his love life. Master Roman smiled, but he told himself it was the end. It's over, he thought. One morning, five days after that celebration, the doctor found him to be doing very poorly. At least this is what Roman discerned in his expression behind the following disingenuous words. This is nothing. You just need to put aside thoughts of musical compositions. Compositions. It was precisely this word from the doctor that gave the master a thought. As soon as he was alone with his manservant, he opened the drawer where, since 1779, he'd kept his unfinished nuptial song. He reread those notes that came out at such great cost, never completed, and then he had a remarkable idea to finish the work now, be it as it may, whatever it took, once and for all, he would leave on this earth a piece of his soul. Who knows, perhaps in 1880 someone will play this and it will be said it's a master Roman. The introduction of the song finished on a definite A natural. This A, which fell right into place, was the last written note. Master Roman ordered that his harpsichord be brought to him in the back room that overlooked the yard. He needed air. By the window, he saw through the rear window of another house two newlyweds of eight days, leaning into each other with arms over shoulders, two hands laced together, each one captive of the other. Master Roman smiled with sadness. They arrive, he said. I depart. I will compose at least this song that they will be able to sing. He sat down at the harpsichord, replayed the notes, and came to the A. Nothing. It didn't carry forward. And yet, he knew music like people. Impossible. No inspiration whatsoever. He didn't require a piece profoundly original, but something in the end that was not someone else's music, which would connect to complete the thought he'd once started. He returned to the introduction, repeated the notes, searching to recover a tiny scrap of a sensation long extinct. He recalled his wife and their first days together. To complete the illusion, his eyes returned to the window, looking toward the newlyweds. They were still at it, hands locked up in each other's arms and shoulders intertwined. The only difference is that now their eyes were lost in each other's instead of looking down. Short of breath now because of sickness and impatience, Master Roman returned to his harpsichord, but the sight of the couple didn't supply the inspiration. 
and the notes remained unsounded. Desperate, he stood up from the harpsichord, taking up his manuscript, and tore it into pieces. At this very moment, the young lady, intoxicated beneath the gaze of her husband, began to croon softly back to him, unconsciously, something never sung or heard before, in which a certain A-natural flowed into a beautiful phrase of music. Precisely the one Master Roman had been searching for over the years with nothing to show for it. The master listened to it with sadness. He shook his white head and later surrendered his final measure of breath into the night. Nuptial Song by Machado de Assis, first published in 1884, translated from Portuguese for audio performance by Todd Connor, copyright 2020. Janine Ray Heller graces this episode with her commissioned interpretation of Santa, written by Chiquinho Gonzaga in 1903. Lyrics were later written by poet Alberto G. Oliveira, who was a founder of the Brazilian Academy of Letters, along with the author of this story, Machado de Assis. Janine is a Los Angeles-based guitarist, singer-songwriter, and one of the elite few virtuosos of the musical saw. Her playing can be heard on the recordings of Joan Baez, Ricky Lee Jones, Michael Hedges, Elvis Perkins, Joss Whedon, and Shawnee Kilgore, and now fortunately here on The Carrie Orker. She's made numerous appearances on primetime network television as well. For more information, reach out to Janine on the Facebook link provided in the description text. All rights to the recordings in this podcast are retained by the artists who perform them. If you like this work and would like to support The Carrie Orker, please consider making a purchase at The Carrie Orker Podcast Store. A direct link is available on the website at www.thecarrieorker.com. Or if you'd like to make a donation, click on the website's link for PayPal. 
Commercial or private sponsorship of future episodes can include the recording of a story live at your own location. See the website for details. In the meantime, as always, listen, like, share, and subscribe. Thank you.